Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. This morning, <clears throat> we are going to continue our preparation so that we may be able to take a good look at what the Lord has presented to us in Zechariah chapter 4. Now, as a note, in preparing for this study, I have been very surprised at the number of Spirit of Prophecy references that are found in regard to this one chapter. At this point, there is very close to 45 pages of notes, all with admonitions. So we may be doing this study a little bit differently than we have in the past, but there's going to be quite a bit that we're going to be looking at. So as we prepare for this study, there are several documents that we're going to be going over, several items that we're going to need to consider. And there will be times I will be asking for participation. So be prepared. So shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his direction, and for his blessing as we open his word today. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you, Father, for the challenges that have beset upon us this week. We thank you for the opportunities that we've had to be able to read, to study, and to share your word. We ask now, Father, for your guidance and your direction. We ask for your blessing. Direct us now. Show us that which you would have us to understand. May our minds be open and receptive. May this time of study together be a benefit to all who are involved in the study today and for those that may choose to view this study later. Father, please send your angels. <clears throat> please, Father, send your spirit. Help us each one to understand that which you would have us to know at this time. We thank you for these challenges. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your guidance. We praise you for all of this. We ask now for your direction. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, one of the things as I prepare for these studies to be aware of is I like to make use of source documents. I like to go back into the spirit of prophecy. I generally do not make references using manuscript releases or compilations. And the items <clears throat> that are used are primarily those that are written during the time of Mrs. White's life. What is before you right now is Life Sketches, Chapter 32. <clears throat> So, as Mrs. White wrote, on the night of April 30th, 1871, I retired to rest much depressed in spirits. For three months, I had been in a state of general discouragement. I had frequently prayed in anguish of spirit for relief. I had implored help and strength from God that I might rise above the heavy discouragements that were paralyzing my faith and my hope and unfitting me for usefulness. This time period is roughly nine years before the passing of James.
That night, I had a dream which made a very happy impression upon my mind. I dreamed that I was attending an important meeting at which a large company were assembled. Many were bowed before God in earnest prayer, and they seemed to be burdened. They were importuning the Lord for special light. A few seemed to be in agony of the spirit. Their feelings were intense. With tears, they were crying aloud for help and for light. Our most prominent brethren were engaged in the most impressive scene. Brother A was prostrated upon the floor, apparently in deep distress. His wife was sitting among a company of indifferent scorners. She looked as though she desired all to understand that she scorned those who were thus humiliating themselves. This representation is showing what? Is this, from Mrs. White, not showing us a divided house? Because if a brother was prostrate, in distress, in prayer, and his wife was choosing to sit among a company of indifferent scorners, is this a house united? So consider this. I dreamed that the Spirit of the Lord came upon me, <clears throat> and I arose among cries and prayers and said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. I feel urged to say to you that you must commence to work individually for yourselves. Are we today to work individually for ourselves? Yes, we are. Yes, we are with God. Okay. You are looking to God and desiring him to do the work for you, which he has left for you to do. If you will do the work for yourselves, which you know that you ought to do, then God will help you when you need help. You have left undone the very things which God has left for you to do. You have been calling upon God to do your work. Had you followed the light which he has given you, then he would cause more light to shine upon you. But while you have, you have neglected the counsels, the warnings, and the reproofs with, that had been given, how can you expect God to give you more light and blessings to neglect and to despise? God is not as man. He will not be trifled with. Now, what does this portion of this paragraph say to us, each one? Are we to expect God to miraculously change our character? No. Are we to expect God to come to us with a miracle message that we are to give to the world? No. Is she not saying in this dream that the light that God has been given has not been followed? I mean, it, it's incredible to me to look at this, to understand that this dream was occurring before Uriah Smith came out with his pronouncements. Before Brother Butler came out with his. 
How can we expect more light if we are neglecting the counsels, the warnings, and the reproofs that have been given? This is the question that she is posing before the brethren at this time. Now, if this passage, if this admonition is written more for our time than for theirs, then is this not something we need to accept right now? Mm -hmm. I took the precious Bible and surrounded it with the several testimonies for the church given for the people of God. Now, at this time in 1871, was there testimony number nine in the bound edition that we're, we've come to see? No. I mean, at this, at this point, I believe that we would, we would be maybe as far as testimonies number five in the bound no. edition. No, not that far. Okay. That's going to be, uh, um, well, um, that's going to be a few more years still. That's going to be in uh, 1780 or so. Because this is what? This is what year? 1871. Yeah. So you're still looking a lot more years. Well, as you as you just said, that these testimonies would be given in 1780. No, no. Uh, 18 1880. I meant. Okay. Is right. is testimony volume five? Okay. Around because we're reading that right now. And, um, okay. So it's in the 18, 1880s. Okay. Not so the testimony, testimony number five would have been in the era of either just before or just after James passing, right? Yeah. Around mm -hmm. there. I can find more precisely. But. Okay. Uh, but that's actually 1889 it was published, but it's right. it's going to start with uh, messages in 1881. Okay. So that's starting about 10 years after that we've got this. Yeah. So you would have this. This would be like volume two. That's published in 1871. So, so this would be either material that's published in volume two or the beginning of volume three. So we're talking actually volumes, <clears throat> volumes one and two. Yeah. Well, yeah, around there, volume two okay. or maybe volume three. Yeah. Okay. The comment from the chat is that this is reminding me of her statement that we, we cannot be benefited by the third angel's message if we haven't received the first and the second, along with the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. I took the precious Bible and surrounded it with several testimonies for the church given for the people of God. Here, said I, the cases of nearly all are met. The sins they are to shun are pointed out. The counsel that they desire can be found here, given for other cases situated similarly to themselves. God has been pleased to give you line upon line and precept upon precept. But there are not many of you that really know what is contained in the testimonies. You are not familiar with the scriptures. If you had made God's word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain to Christian perfection, you would not have needed the testimonies. It is because you have neglected to acquaint yourself with God's inspired book that he has sought to reach you by simple direct testimonies, calling your attention to the words of inspiration which you had neglected to obey and urging you to fashion your lives in accordance with its pure and elevated teachings. Now, does this help us to recall anything else? I 
And I'm being specific. If you had made God's word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain to Christian perfection, you would not have needed the testimonies. Have we ever heard a comment like this before? Mm -hmm. Yes, many times. And how has that been applied? How does it apply to what? How has that comment been applied? Well, for me, it's, you know, it's like she said, make study the word of God. Okay. <clears throat> if the children of Israel had followed the admonitions that we find throughout the Old Testament, would there have been a need for what we find in the New Testament. No. If the Protestant churches had followed the admonitions within the Bible, would there have been a need for a prophet to have been raised up as Mrs. White was? I mean, I, I look at these things all the time that we have many churches around us that claim to be New Testament churches because they wish to reject the Old Testament. We have the Jews that will have nothing to do with the New Testament, but yet they don't understand the Old Testament. And then here we are. We have plain, direct, simple testimonies. By 1880, we had Uriah Smith making the comment that had <clears throat> that when Mrs. White gave a public vision, a public testimony that that was from God. But when she was giving a written testimony, as are being referred to here, that that was just her opinion. How many times do we find today within the movement and within the Advent Church that the testimonies are set aside? Well, you know, the one thing that we see in, in the church is that the testimonies really are, are relegated to be devotional in nature, right. not authoritative. So, you know, for instance, in the area of biblical chronology, uh, they're deemed to be worthless. Which they are not. <clears throat> we can see that quite clearly once we... We examine Ellen White's chronological structure. It doesn't agree with the opinions of, of man, but it does agree with the word of God. And and it's not Usher's chronology. Right. So it's not a chronology that I found anywhere else except in the spirit of prophecy in the Bible. Right. The Lord deigns to warn you, to reprove, to counsel through the testimonies given, and to impress your minds with the importance of the truth of his word. The written testimonies are not to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the heart the truths of inspiration already revealed. So, in 1871... Is this not a like a, a foreshadowing of what was going to happen in 1888? Mm -hmm. were, were the messages of Jones and Wagner new light? 
Mm -hmm. I thought she said that these were old light in new settings. Right, which is what new light is. Okay. New, new light is an unfolding of, a, of old light. It's just seeing old light with more details added. So okay. when we talk about new light and it rejects old light, then it's not new light at all. Okay. Does anybody else have a thought on that? They're building on building on the old paths. Progressing on the old paths, right? Yeah, yeah, right. progressing. Yeah. Man's duty to God and to his fellow man has been distinctly specified in God's word. Yet, but few of you are obedient to the light given. Additional truth is not brought out, but God has, through the testimonies, simplified the great truths already given, <clears throat> and in his own chosen way brought them before the people to awaken and impress the mind with them, that all may be left without excuse. Does God desire any to be lost? No. What is his desire? Is it not that he desires all to be saved? Mm -hmm. Pride, self-love, selfishness, hatred, envy, and jealousy have beclouded the perceptive powers and the truth, which would make you wise unto salvation, has lost its power to charm and control the mind. The very essential principles of godliness are not understood because there is not a hungering and thirsting for Bible knowledge, for purity of heart and holiness of life. The testimonies are not to belittle the word of God, but to exalt it and attract minds to it, that the beautiful simplicity of truth may impress all. I said further, as the word of God is walled in with these books and pamphlets, so has God walled you in with reproofs, with counsel, warnings, and encouragements. Here you are crying before God in anguish of your souls for more light. I am authorized from God to tell you that not another ray of light through the testimonies will shine upon your pathway until you make a practical use of the light already given. The Lord has walled you about with light, but you have not appreciated the light. You have trampled upon it. While some have despised the light, others have neglected it or followed it, but indifferently. A few have set their hearts to obey the light which God has been pleased to give them. Here we're in a situation. We are looking at the Bible. We are taking the Bible as the inspired word of God, looking for symbols, looking at chronology, seeing things that we have never seen before, and yet there are many that would set this aside as nothing more than another version of time setting. Now, if she was authorized from God to say that not another ray of light through the testimonies would shine upon our pathway until we make practical use of the light already given, Is this not an admonition that we should be paying attention to these studies in chronology to learn more so that we may understand more? The Lord has already given us great light. We have great light through this with the spirit of prophecy. We have great light 
throughout the Bible, but in so many cases, that great light is being shunned, that great light is being trampled on. Some that have received special warnings through testimony have forgotten in a few weeks the reproof given. The testimonies to some have been several times repeated, but they have not thought them of sufficient importance to be carefully heeded. They have been to them like idle tales. Had they regarded the light given, they would have avoided losses and trials which they think are hard and severe. They have only themselves to censure. They have placed upon their own necks a yoke, which they find grievous to the bone. It is not the yoke which Christ is bound upon them. God's care and love were exercised in their behalf, but their selfish, evil, unbelieving souls could not discern his goodness and mercy. They rush on in their own wisdom until, overwhelmed with trials and confused with perplexity, they are ensnared by Satan. When you gather up the rays of light which God has given in the past, then will he give an increase of light. How did the Millerites come to appreciate the validity of of prophetic truths. Did they not come to understand that the truths of prophecy were valid from placing line upon line, precept upon precept, and doing so with the numbers that were put before them? How else did they come to understand August 11th, 1840? How else did they come to understand October 22nd, 1844? And this chronology was really given them by God. Right. It wasn't, it, it couldn't have been derived from man's wisdom because many people, we're trying to figure out the chronology of the Bible and how to understand these prophetic periods. But God gave this, he chose Miller and he gave him the starting points. Right. And, and, and the principles involved, the year day principle and applied it in a correct way. And then with Josiah Litch, he, he was, you know, given this light, really, he didn't fully understand what he was doing. And we, we've shown that, that, that he didn't really understand uh, properly how to come to August 11th, 1840 for the end of the second woe, but he did so without the proper knowledge to do so. That's the thing I find interesting. Well, you know, he, he never understood the 26th day of the fourth month. And right. because people look at his study and they, they find holes in it, but if they studied further, they would see that God had directed him. There are many that claim that there are holes in the understanding of October 22nd, 1844. Mm -hmm. Yet, the more that we look at the 490 years of Daniel 9 and its interrelationship with the 2300 evening mornings, mm -hmm. the holes are not so much holes, but they are opportunities for us to be able to point and to show that our Heavenly Father has been leading each step of the way. Mm -hmm. Amen. We are not to rush on our own wisdom. We are not to place ourselves upon the adversary's ground. We are to gather up the rays of light, which God has given in the past. 
We are to appreciate what the pioneers went through. We are to look more carefully at the lessons that they were teaching so that we will then receive an increase of light for this time. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that this admonition in the way that this, this has been published is on Life Sketches page 200.1 or 2001. As a symbol, have we not seen great light coming to us since September 11, 2001? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Now, how long has that been for us, brothers and sisters? Almost 22 years. Well, if we were to look at it today, yes, almost. But as of as of today, this would have been over the last 22 years. Mm -hmm. If we look at 22, do we also not see a symbol of 220? Yeah, restoration. Yes. So is this time also a restoration to the old paths. Yes. I can see that. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else? It's also a doubling. Yes, it is that too. So not only do we have a restoration, but we have a affirmation of the first and the second angel's message specifically the second angel's message yeah and if if we think about the second angel's message um you know that you know that's um uh you know august 15th that's when it's empowered you know we just passed august 15th 2023 so um it's august 19th today um so that's something that we always need to to consider okay i referred them to ancient israel god gave them his law and what is the following point that she makes Right here. But they would not obey it. God's law was given in awful grandeur at Sinai. God deigned to give his law directly to his chosen people. The day that they received the law, the day that they received the covenant, they made the promise, all this we will do. But how long after that was it that they turned their backs upon the law that they promised to obey? God then gave them ordinances and ceremonies that in the performance of these, God might be kept in remembrance. Has the Sabbath become nothing but a ceremony for us? Are we choosing to keep the law in spirit and in truth? Or are we doing it by rote or by, or by just habit or just by some kind of habit correct which is rote yeah 
they were so prone to forget him and his claims upon them that it was necessary to keep their minds stirred up to realize their obligations to obey and honor their creator. Had they been obedient, had they loved to keep God's commandments, the multitude of ceremonies and ordinances would not have been required. Consider that for a moment. Here had the law, had the commandments, had the covenant been honored. The ceremonies and the ordinances that were to point their minds back to God would not have been necessary. If the people who now profess to be God's peculiar treasure would obey his requirements as specified in his word, special testimonies would not be given to awaken them to their duty and impress upon them their sinfulness and their fearful danger in neglecting to obey the word of God. Who are the people that are God's peculiar treasure today? Does this admonition not fall upon the movement and upon the church? You know, it's, it's not easy to do this kind of research and read these kind of admonitions. Because every time that I have to look around, I've got three fingers directly pointing right back at me, saying to me, I am not keeping the word of God, the commandments of God as I should. Consciences have been blunted because the light has been set aside. It's been neglected and it's been despised. And God will remove these testimonies from the people and will deprive them of strength and humble them. What do you think of that sentence? How does that impact us today? Do we want to see the testimonies removed? Do we want to be deprived of God's strength? No. You know, one of the things I think about and what, what you're reading here is um, we know that if we were following God, we would see his power being manifested. Right. We would see souls being converted. We, we criticize the church because, well, no real conversions are happening. But yet within the movement itself, it's rare to see the working of God. We just see the working of man. We, we in a sense, have been deprived of strength. You know, the, the fact that, that there is no real working of the Holy Spirit upon this movement, other than the light that he keeps giving us, but as far as upon the heart, we don't really see people being converted. And yet somehow we just accept that that's normal. You know, in fact, we see people being discouraged. And when you point out that people are discouraged and, and they're discouraged because of the, the disunity in the movement, um, you're criticized for pointing that out. It's like, well, they just would have left anyway. And, and I don't think that, that that is a good attitude. No, it's not. It takes away our responsibility. We have a responsibility uh, to others. But often I've seen the attitude, 
oh, well, they just left because, you know, they weren't really interested in the truth. And, and the reality is some of those people that left this movement were much more interested in the truth than the people who are still in the movement. I have seen many that have made the choice that the message that is to be given is only one small part of God's law. We are not to separate the portions of God's law any more than we can choose to break one commandment and not be guilty of all. Our conscience needs to be tender rather than being blunted. We cannot afford to set aside any of the light. We cannot afford to set aside anything dealing with chronology. We cannot afford to set aside anything having to do with the testimonies. We are not to neglect or despise the light that we are finding. Because if we do, we will find that we are being deprived of the light. We are de being deprived of the strength that God is willing to give us. And then he's going to leave us in a condition where we are going to be severely humbled. I dreamt that as I was speaking, the power of God fell upon me in a most remarkable manner. And I was deprived of all strength. Yet I had no vision. Now, if a prophet has no vision, <clears throat> what happens to the people? They perish. Exactly. <clears throat> I thought my husband stood up before the people and exclaimed, this is the wonderful power of God. He has made the testimonies a powerful means of reaching souls, and he will work yet more mightily through them than he has hitherto done, who will be on the Lord's side. <clears throat> I dreamt that quite a number instantly sprang to their feet and responded to the call. Others sat sullen, some manifested scorn and derision, and a few seemed wholly unmoved. One stood by my side and said, Yet here, are we to sit sullenly by? Are we to be scorning and deriding the light that is being given? Are we to ignore this light? Here we are given another comment. God has raised you up and has given you words to speak to the people and to reach hearts as he has given to no other one. He has shaped your testimonies to meet cases that are in need of help. You must be unmoved by the scorn, by the derision, by the reproach and the censure. In order to be God's special instrument, you should learn, you should lean to no one, but hang upon God alone. And like the clinging vine, let your tendrils intertwine about him. He will make you a means through which to communicate his light to the people. You must daily gather strength from God in order to be fortified that your surroundings may not dim or eclipse the light that he has permitted to shine upon his people through you. 
It is Satan's special object to prevent this light from coming to the people of God who so greatly need it among the perils of these last days. Is this the admonition that we need today? Are we being shown that we are to be unmoved by scorn, derision, reproach, and censure? <laughs> are we being presented that we need to be more like the clinging vine rather than being the independent plant? Your success is in your simplicity. As soon as you depart from this and fashion your testimony to meet the minds of any, your power is gone. Almost everything in this age is glossed and unreal. The world abounds in testimonies given to please and charm for the moment and to exalt self. Your testimony is of a different character. It is to come down to the minutia of life, keeping the feeble faith from dying and pressing home upon believers the necessity of shining as lights in the world. God has given you your testimony to set before the backslider, and the sinner, his true condition. And the immense loss he is sustaining by continuing a life of sin. God has impressed this upon you by opening it before your vision as he has to no other one now living. And according to the light he has given you, Will he hold you responsible, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Zechariah 4.6, Isaiah 58.1. What symbols can we derive from these passages? Have we not been studying? What do we see when we see 4 6? I mean, I see the temple, body temple. Okay. What do we see when we see this number, this series of numbers, 5 8 1? Is there anything else that we can derive from this? Well, that's, we, we got 158, we got uh, the 15th uh, day of the eighth month. Right. Now, 158 being very simple is a league. For six, we are brought to this with the temple. Are we not to be in league with Christ so that the living temple is then built? This dream, go ahead. I just said that's the only way. It's what we need to consider at our time right now, is it not? Yes. This dream had a powerful influence upon me. When I awoke, my depression was gone. My spirits were cheerful, and I realized great peace. 
Infirmities that had unfitted me for labor were removed, and I realized a strength and a vigor to which I had had for months been a stranger. It seemed to me that the angels of God had been commissioned to bring me relief. Unspeakable gratitude filled my heart for this great change from despondency to light and happiness. I knew that help had come from God. This manifestation appeared to me like a miracle of God's mercy, and I will not be ungrateful for his loving kindness. Now, for something that was written in 1871, I see a document, I see a dream that is prevented, that's presented for us today, excuse me, to tell us to lift up our eyes, to be grateful to God for his leading. And I see this symbol on this page of 2023. I believe that our Heavenly Father, through the admonition and the use of his prophet, is telling us that it's time that we wake up and we recognize that he is still leading this movement. Mm -hmm. And that while men may decide to act with scorn that they may choose to deride everything that's being said that God is working according to his will and not ours Amen. now We're going to return to a document that we started to read last week. We're going to try to finish this today. Now, is this open before you? Yeah, yeah I see it. Yep. Okay. Now, we're going to refresh this just a little bit. When those who are poor embrace the truth and do the very best of their ability, our Heavenly Father will see when they have gone to the extent of their ability, and he will bring in other talents in order to carry forward his work. There is a wonderful work to be done for the Master yet, and we want to act like living soldiers of the cross of Christ. That's Manuscript 14, 1887. Paragraph 18. So this is written roughly 16 years after the manuscript or the, the document we just finished. Some things are presented to me in a dream, September 29th, 1886, which I wish here to read. This was presented to her on the 29th day of the sixth month of the biblical year of 5931. Did we determine last week the importance of that 29th day of the sixth month. As we consider this, this dream is being given just before the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. That feast, lasting for 10 days, was to call the people to a convocation, to call them to understand and listen to the word of the Lord. In a dream given me September 29, 1886, I was walking with a large company who were looking for berries. There were many young men and women in the company who were here 
to help in gathering the fruit. They seem, we seem to be in a city for there was very little vacant ground, but around the city there were open fields, beautiful groves, and cultivated gardens. A large wagon laden with provisions for our company went before us. Soon the wagon halted, and the party scattered in every direction to look for fruit. All around the wagon were both high and low bushes, bearing large, be beautiful whortleberries. But the company were all looking too far away to see them. I began to gather the fruit nearby, but very carefully for fear of picking the green berries, which were so mingled with the ripe fruit that I could pick only one or two berries from a cluster. What happens when we're looking too far away from the object that is currently at hand? Do we you lose sight of you lose sight of the? Uh, we lose sight of the object that we're supposed to take care of, right? Right. Some of the nice large berries had fallen to the ground and were half consumed by worms and insects. Oh, thought I, if this field had only been entered before, all this precious fruit might have been saved. But it is too late now. I will, however, pick these from the ground and see if there is any good in them. Even if the whole berry is spoiled, I can at least show the brethren what they might have found if they had not been too late. Just then, two or three of the party came sauntering around where I was. They were chatting and seemed to be much occupied with each other's company. Seeing me, they said, we have looked everywhere and we can find no fruit. They looked with astonishment at the quantity that I had. I said, there are more to be gathered from these bushes. They began picking, but soon stopped saying, it is not fair for us to pick here. You found this spot and the fruit is yours. But I replied, this makes no difference. Gather whatever you can find anything. This is God's field. And these are his berries. It is your privilege to pick them. What are the berries representing here? Truth. Well, okay. people. Yes. They are representing the harvest that God is looking for in this earth, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. But soon I seemed to be alone again. Every little while I heard talking and laughing at the wagon. I called out to those who were there. What are you doing? They answered, we could not find any berries. And as we were tired and we were hungry, we thought that we would come to the wagon and take a lunch. And after we have rested a while, we will go out again. But I said, you have brought in nothing as of yet. You are eating up all of our supplies without giving us any more. I cannot eat now. There is too much fruit to be picked. You did not find it because you did not look close enough. It does not hang on the outside of the bushes. You must search for it. True, you cannot pick it by handfuls, but by looking carefully among the green berries, you will find very choice fruit. My small pail was soon full of berries and I took them to the wagon. Said I, this is the nicest fruit that I have ever picked. And I gathered it nearby while you have wearied yourselves by searching at a distance without success. Then all came to see my fruit. They said, these are high bush berries, firm and good. We did not think we could find anything on the high bushes. 
So we hunted for low bush berries only and found but few of these. When all came to see her fruit, what other presentation is brought to mind? Well, I think um, Jesus and the fig tree. What about William Miller's second dream? Come and see. Oh, okay. <clears throat> then I said, will you take care of these berries and then go with me to look for more fruit on the high bushes? But they'd made no preparation to care for the fruit. How often do we see no preparation being made to be able to teach, instruct, and encourage those that come into the message? There were dishes and sacks in abundance, but they had been used to hold food. I became tired of waiting and finally asked, did you not come to gather fruit? Then why are you not prepared to take care of it? Comment from the chat that the hortleberry is a European blueberry. I have to ask, you know, in, in a way of speaking, are these not like the Saskatoons? Uh, no. Okay. No, these are more blueberries. Okay. Look, Saskatoons grow on a tree. Right. These grow on, on bushes. And they grow on high bushes. Yeah. Okay. One responded, Sister White, we did not really expect to find any fruit where there were so many houses and so much going on. But as you seem so anxious to gather fruit, we decided to come with you. We thought we would bring and would enjoy the recreation if we did not gather any fruit. Here we have one steward returning well of their talents and we have other stewards that are not returning of their talents question that we have for ourselves what which steward are we going to look more toward are we going to take the time to help to gather the fruit or are we going to take the time to think that there is no fruit to gather? I answered, I cannot, I cannot understand this kind of work. I shall go to the bushes again at once. The day is already far spent. Soon night will be here in which we can gather no fruit. Some went with me, but others remained by the wagon to eat. The day is already far spent. And soon the night will be here. Uh, uh, just uh, sorry to interrupt here, but uh, Angela made a comment, which is kind of interesting, because I was just looking at the, the sunset right. in uh, Bucharest, Romania. Right. And it sets at 8.15 tonight. Interesting. So here again, another symbol of the 15th day of the eighth month or of 158. Mm -hmm. another, another symbol of the lead. 
but it's also a symbol of the midnight cry. Yes, agreed. So, so there's like a choice there. So and and from the chat, from what was what was being said, is that it would look that you are currently looking and ministering to the European, as in Romanian, Russian, German, Hungarian, blueberries. Mm -hmm. So you're, you are ministering to these whortleberries currently. Mm -hmm. And I had blueberries for breakfast. Really? Yeah. Very nice. In one place, a little company had collected and were busily talking about something in which they seemed much interested. I drew near and found that a little child in a woman's arms had attracted their attention. I said, you have but a little time and might better work while you can. The attention of many was attracted by a young man and a young woman who were running a race to the, to the wagon. On reaching it, they were so tired that they had to sit down and rest. Others had also thrown themselves down on the grass to rest. Thus the day wore on, and very little was accomplished. At last I said, brethren, you call this an unsuccessful expedition. If this is the way you work, I do not wonder at your lack of success. Your success or failure depends on the way you take hold of the work. There are berries here, for I have found them. Some of you have been searching the low bushes in vain. Others have found a few berries. But the high bushes have been passed by simply because you did not expect to find fruit on them. You see that the fruit which I have gathered is large and ripe. In a little while, other berries will ripen, and we can go over the bushes again. This is the way in which I was taught to gather fruit. If you had searched near the wagon, you might have found fruit as well as I. The lesson that you have this day given to those who are just learning how to do this kind of work will be copied by them. The Lord has placed these fruit-bearing bushes right in the midst of these thickly settled places, and he expects you to find them. But you have been altogether too much engaged in eating and amusing yourselves. You did not come to the field with an earnest determination to find fruit. You must hereafter work with more zeal and earnestness and with an altogether different object in view or your labors will never be successful. In working in the right way, you will teach the younger workers that such matters as eating and recreation are of minor importance. It has been hard to bring the wagon of supplies to the ground but you have thought more of the supplies than of the fruit you ought to carry home as a result of your labors. You should be diligent first to pick the berries nearest you and then to search for those farther away. After that, you can return to work nearby again and thus you will be successful. I do not know that I need to put an interpretation on this. I think that anyone of intelligence can trace out its true meaning. You, we want in the first place to consecrate ourselves to God without reserve. We want to be in season and out of season. We want to sow the seed of truth wherever we can do so and wherever the laborers go. They are to go in the strength of God. There is a lesson to be learned from Gideon's army. How often have we studied this with Gideon's army? 
it was not because of their great numbers that they prevailed, but because they were willing to follow the special directions of God by living faith. Those that were seen to press on to the battle and who would scoop up the water and drink as they went were the ones whom God accepted to engage in this enterprise. But those who prepared to have a good time and bowed down leisurely and drank were sent back to their homes. How many were in Gideon's army? You got 300. How many Millerite preachers were there? 300. So today, though the numbers be few, should we not begin to accept and learn a lesson of God's way of working for our salvation? Yeah. <clears throat> the Lord God of Israel looks upon us individually. And he sees whether we are in earnest in this matter. He sees whether we carry the burden of souls upon our hearts. He sees whether or not we touch these living interests with the tip ends of our fingers. If we have the interest that John Knox had when we pleaded before God for Scotland, we shall have success. He cried, Give me Scotland, Lord, or I die. And when we take hold of the work and wrestle with God, saying, I must have souls, I will never give up the struggle, we shall find that God will look upon our efforts with favor. He sees that if we give you souls as a result of your ministry, it will not make you proud or lifted up. You will not be in a position where you will feel for an instant that someone else will get the credit for these souls. But you will feel so grateful to God that they are saved, that his praise will be in your hearts and on your lips day and night. It is such men that God will make mighty instruments to do his work. I feel in earnest upon these points. What can we take away from this dream? What can we take away from these berries? What do you think at this time? Well, we have a work to do. We have a very great work to be done, don't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the book that we are studying today The book that we are to be learning from is Zechariah chapter 4. Now, in the time we have remaining, we're going to look briefly at a couple of items.
Okay. Is this sharing? It says screen share is loading. Sorry. Okay. Can you see Zachariah 4 now? Yeah. Now, in the King James Version, there are two divisions of Zechariah 4. The first, by the golden candlestick, is foreshowed the good success of Zerubbabel's foundation. And by verse 11, by the two olive trees, we are shown the two anointed ones. Letter 29, 1896, beginning in paragraph 15. There are men who stand in the pulpits as shepherds, professing to feed the flock. But the sheep are starving for the bread of life. There are long drawn out discourses, largely made up of the relation of antidotes. But the hearts of the hearers are not touched. The feelings of some may be moved. They may shed a few tears, but their hearts are not broken. The Lord Jesus has been present when they have been presenting that which was called sermons, but their words were destitute of the dew and the rain of heaven. They evidenced that the anointed ones described in Zechariah, here we are to see chapter 4, had not ministered to them, that they might minister to others. When the anointed ones empty themselves through the golden pipes, the golden oil flows out of themselves into the golden bowls to, for, to flow forth unto the lamps, the churches. This is the work of every true devoted servant of the living God. The Lord God of heaven cannot approve much that is brought into the pulpit by those who are professedly speaking the word of the Lord. They do not inculcate ideas that will be a blessing to those who hear. There is a cheap, very cheap fodder placed before the people. What happens when, fought, when cheap fodder is presented before the animals? Do they receive the nourishment that they are to receive? And is this not the case that we are finding today in many, in many places? When the speaker shall, in a haphazard way, strike in anywhere as the fancy strikes him, when he talks politics to the people, he is mingling the common fire with the sacred. He dishonors God. He has not real evidence from God that he is speaking the truth. He does his hearers a grievous wrong. He plants seeds which shall strike their fibrous roots deep, and they spring up and bear poisonous fruit how dare men do this how dare they advance ideas when they do not know certainly whence they came or that they are the truth will our brethren bear in mind that we are living among the perils of the last days read revelation in connection with daniel have we not had this admonition before, that Revelation and Daniel should be studied together? Teach these things. Let discourses be short, spiritual, and elevated. Let the preacher be full of the word of the Lord. Let every man who enters the pulpit know that he has angels from heaven in his audience. What do you think about that statement, brothers and sisters?
And when these angels empty from themselves the golden oil of truth into the heart of him who is teaching the word, then the application of the truth will be a solemn, serious matter. The angel messengers will expel sin from the heart unless the door of the heart is padlocked and Christ is refused admission. Christ will withdraw himself from those who persist in refusing the heavenly blessings that are so freely offered them. Can we think of a passage in the Bible where Christ is refused admission? Yeah, the rich man. Where else? What of had, the... Go, excuse me? He had uh, King David, uh, not King uh, Saul. Okay. What about the example that's presented for us in the Song of Solomon? If you open with me, Song of Solomon, chapter 5, we will use this example to more directly examine this of the door of the heart being padlocked and Christ being refused admission. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1. I am coming to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh and with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. I sleep. And this is the bride speaking. And who is the bride of Christ? Who have we been shown in scripture is the bride of Christ? This is the church. So the bride here is speaking. Yes. I sleep. But well, technically, heart... Yeah, technically, this is the Shulamit, right? Okay. And, and that's actually the feminine form of the name Solomon. Okay. It's just something no, no, to notice about this that that Solomon is writing about Christ's love for him, but he is the king. He represents the church. Okay. Now, the Shulamite is also seen as being a bit dark-skinned, right? Well, yeah. The, the idea here is that she's not attractive at all, except in the eyes of the beloved. Okay. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped in, dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. So is this door locked? Yes. 
I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul fainted when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him, I am sick of love. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost charge us? Do we all not understand the admonition to Laodicea? For what does Christ tell us there? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man heareth my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Exactly. Now, it is because of this passage in the Song of Solomon, in Canticles, that we have this reference, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Because Revelation was accepted as being necessary scripture, but there were many that did not accept this in canticles as being as necessary. Now the comment from the chat said, Christ was refused entrance to Samaria at a certain point because he was going to Jerusalem. Luke 9, 52 to 56. The yearning of the savior for the despised and despairing is shown here. Okay. I would say <clears throat> that Christ's great love for his people is being shown here within this Song of Songs. Yet many today are choosing to lock the door of their hearts. Now we are at the close of our time together today. We will return to much of this this next week. Any other comments or questions? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you have provided. We thank you, Father, for these words of admonition so that we may learn more and be prepared for the greater light that you are willing to give to us. Be with us each one this Sabbath. Help us that we may more properly represent your character to all with whom we come in contact. Direct us now to this end. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.